And they have these uh, 15th century Vietnamese uh, wall decorations. So it is a 15th century structure, no doubt. Tuban, he mentions Tuban. Um, there's another tomb of one of the, the, the nine saints, the Wali Sono, and he, he visited this tomb. He also mentions a carved door. And I think he mixed up that one with this one in Pati, which is nearby, and which is probably a Bajapai period door. If you go to Pati to see it, however, it's still in the village. Um, he mentions all the way to Probolingo, almost the eastern end of Java. He sort of covered almost the whole area. Um, this is what that particular site looks like today, pretty well preserved. And uh, this is one of the smaller temples there at Tanshani Jabo. Again, it's lost a little bit of the roof, more or less like Raffles depicted it, with the Kala head up there. And again, there are more temples he saw than exist today. There are these drawings of other sites just called unidentified Greek temples. We have no idea where they were. Some of them are not specifically labeled as to where they came from. They don't exist anymore. Um, they just give an idea of the range of archaeological sites which Raffles was visiting at that time. Now, of course, 1816, Raffles leaves Java, Dutch take over, he goes back to London, publishes his book, gets his knighthood, and then wants to come back to the Indies. And he's, of course, this is, well, people think of, say, the Dutch East Indies as covering all of Indonesia. In 1800, he was very small. Outside of most of the uh, north coast of Java, it did not include the sultanates of Mataram. It only included Padan, not the rest of Sumatra. Only included Makassar in the southern tip of Sulawesi. Just a few outposts in the Moluccas. Of course, the, and then there was a, the Portuguese were here. And the rest of Indonesia was still independent <coughs> at this time. And that was basically what Raffles was in charge of. It was just these little um, outposts here and there. And then, of course, we have Rancula down here, the British. And so that was the only foothold the British had, other than, of course, Penang up here. And um, so we were in Malacca also, they have given it back to the Dutch. So Rancula is where Raffles went back to, to try to expand the British foothold in Southeast Asia. And uh, this is Rancula. This is the Sugar Loaf Mountain. That's what the British call that mountain there. And that's where the first British fort was over here, built in 1685. And as you can see, it's basically just a long strip. It's all um, 500 kilometers long. It's not small, actually. It's a 500 kilometer long strip of land along the west coast. And it's a little narrow wedge of flat land and then a lot of mountains. And basically, the British got there when the Dutch kicked them out of Bantan because it was a big source of pepper. And this is how it looked in 1980. So you can imagine it hadn't changed much during Raffles' time. The main method of uh, transport was still things like uh, ox carts, rafts on the rivers. Um, bamboo was still the container of uh, in, uh, in everyday use for things like water. Um, shifting cultivation in the highlands. That was, um, you can, one can imagine easily what it was like in Raffles' time. It was remote because during the southwest monsoon, no ships could be in or out of there. It was just the open Indian Ocean. Huge waves come in. Now, there are no good harbors along the coast, mostly rocky, shingly, gravelly beaches. This is how they would land. They were bringing in uh, things like agricultural supplies just by boat. You just had to land through the surf to get them on the shore. Except right around uh, one place, there's a very beautiful long beach of about uh, five kilometers long pure white sand. And that's where Fort Marlborough was. And that's where Raffles was sent back to in 1818, sorry, 1817. And uh, he was sent off and was on the way there. Of course, he was also in England. He had remarried. He married Sophia. Uh, so uh, he was uh, planning, he had his first child. He never had any children with Olivia. First child, Charlotte, was born on the way to Bakula on the boat. <clears throat> Just like Raffles, he was born on a boat. And so she was one month old. And this is the Lincoln. That's where Raffles lived in this house. <clears throat> and there was a, there basically, other than that, were a couple of houses and there was a big fort. And the, Raffles was extremely depressed when he got here. He says the house was a basically, uh, had been just destroyed by a series of earthquakes. It was only, he only had whole cats living in it, he said. And he said that um, one could not imagine anywhere, any more depressing.
and then the blue line. Um, so that's the way the Ford looked. Um, now that big tower is not there anymore, so at some time that disappeared. Um, but it was quite a sizable um, a fortification that was built in 1715. And that's the way it looks today. The British Council that put some money into fixing it up, it was uh, under, for when I was there, it was actually under the police department was there. But now it's been given to the museum, the local museum, to maintain it. And uh, again, it's still in relatively good condition. It has a pretty good, it was a rather strong fort. This is a kind of a, a plan for setting up some kind, maybe some kind of a, a park around it. So it's right next to the seashore. And uh, it's one of these very elaborate ones with four bastions that had an outer loop here. Then you go in through, it, uh, through, through a drawbridge over the uh, moat and so on. And there's some old British graves in there, old tombstones and so forth still in place. That's when the police were still in charge there. And that was the, you know, the first president of this coast. That was uh, the, the first governor of the site. And there were still other old uh, British period structures. This old uh, warehouse here right in front of the fort, and there's a, uh, um, so that's probably where they put the pepper, which the company, East India Company was buying when they shipped it out, and there's another old house with a kind of similar architecture, which um, was just abandoned when I was living there. And there was a monument to a Captain Hamilton, who was at one time in charge of the troops. A few of these British monuments are still there. And so May 1818, just a few months after arriving, Raffles set off down to the south southern end of his uh, domains, about 250 kilometers away, a place called Mana, with Joseph Arnold, and that's where he found the Ecclesia, the famous flower which is now known as the Ecclesia Arnoldi. After these two guys, this giant flower, it's more than a meter across, it's a parasitic flower, and uh, this is the Mana area, and you can imagine having to travel down there 200 years ago, crossing the rivers, there is a little British period structure still there, which they say it was the treasury, right well of that. So they set up a, there was an out residency there during the British period. Um, and then, okay, this is a Dutch period picture of one of the residents there, the Controuleur, and the local chiefs. Why that was quite important, actually, for several reasons. Um, now, this is the culture of Ghana and the area in the early 20th century. It was not lay. It was quite a different, much more tribal kind of culture at that time. Malays basically lived around the fort, and that was it. The rest of the province was all various other kinds of groups who called themselves the Rajan, Sarawai, and so on. And as you can see, their, um, their garb, their, their features were quite different from what you normally think of as Sumatra. So this is a bridal costume, as, as, and this is in Pasma Ulumana. And this is up in the, this is in Padanguchi, that's in the, the Mana area. You can see there's a lot of gold in that area as well. So it's a quite unique area to visit. Uh, now Raffles didn't know, but actually there are 2,000 year old remains in that same area. Bronze drums, dome stone. There were dome stone artifacts. There's a kind of a, a probably a Buddha pod, a Buddha footprint now in the local museum. And there was quite a strong Chinese influence at some point. The bridal beds are kind of like, them, um, you know, it's a very uh, ornately directed with Chinese textiles and so on. This is all in the Makulu Museum. And now Raffles went all the way up into Pasama. That's what there was important for. Mana was the gateway into the Pasama Highlands, the South Sumatra, which was the center of a 2,500 year old civilization. Way up in the mountains, there are still these prehistoric megalithic type statues up there. There are even remains of, of paintings on the interiors of some of these tombs, like these slab graves. Pictures of warriors carrying bone on drums, riding on elephants, on Dimple in the background, very interesting area. So Raffles went all the way up into the highlands. He was exploring all that he could in the Sumatra region. Um, not too much later, he went up north, all the way to near Kabao, again, way up into the highlands of central Sumatra. They crossed over the lakes in Kara, saw Subaraso, Pagaruyo, very important areas in Malay mythology too, because that's supposedly where one of the three kings who appeared on Bukit Sagunta went up here. You know, in the story of the founding of Singapore, there's a story how there were three kings who appeared on Bukit Sagunta in Palembang. The eldest one went here. 
became the king of Yankaba. The middle one went to Tanzo, um, Tanzo Kura, Borneo, and the youngest one ended up coming to Singapore. So this is seen by the Malays at this time as still the most historic Malay kingdom. That's one reason Raffles was interested. We saw the typical Milan style houses they would have seen, the transportation and things. This is a period where most transport in this area was still on the back. So Raffles and Olivia, sorry, Sophia, Sophia went all the way up in the mountains with him. So she explored a lot of these areas with him at this time. This is the area, this is Lake Sinkara. Um, um, this is the Pasama Highlands, very fertile. Uh, Grafton was very impressed by this, these parts of Sumatra, too. Uh, so in 1818, Raffles goes back to Calcutta to discuss setting up a settlement, which is in a better location than Mukulu. And uh, 1818, December, back to Penang, January, 30, 18, 19, should be Singapore. And uh, so that's where Raffles doesn't follow in Singapore. Raffles finds that there's an authority here and just makes a treaty with the Singaporeans. Then uh, March, his first son is born, Leopold, back, and of course, so Sophia's back in Mokulu all this time, where her husband's running around. In April, he signs this treaty with the Sultan of Aceh. May, he visits Singapore for the second time on the way back to Mokulu, and he finds the Nepenthes, Ecclesiana. So he found this in Singapore, and he named it, of course, uh, partly after himself. And that's when these maps then got drawn sometime around this time. That's when these plans were made for laying out the, see the area on the Padam, for laying out the battery down here. That's when the Temengong's house was still right there. Now with this map, we know exactly where it was, finally. We know how big it was, too. It was huge. And he had also set up an idea for building a fort up here already on the Fort Hamlet at this time. Of course, it never got built. Sanford Martin Raffles. And the next year again, the fourth child, second daughter, Ella, is born. By this time, Raffles is living 12 miles, 18 kilometers out in the countryside, way away from the fort. He set up his own plantation, basically. And this is a painting of his house in a place called Hill of the Dove, Matambala. The bedroom alone is 32 by 22 feet. It was a nice big bungalow. And a veranda ran all the way around the house. And you coffee, nutmegs, and cloves, and 200 cattle, and rice fields, sawa. So I've been looking for the site of this house ever since, basically, and I found more or less where it is. Now, right near it, there is a fort. So we also had a kind of out fort built nearby. Um, and there still remains of the old moat and ramparts that went around it. Several cannon still lying there up in the, in the jungle. And there, now nearby, there are even some old Portuguese cattle. Now, I don't think the Portuguese ever went here, but the Bukulu people were in contact with Bantan. Uh, it was an important uh, harbor uh, for uh, pepper export, but it was not visited by foreigners very much. So I think, now when I went here, um, there were a lot of remains of potsherds lying on, of course, nothing left of the bungalow. But there was a pool nearby, and there was a local legend it's of the, the men, the men Saeed, who used to bathe in the pool. In other words, there had been a white woman who used to bathe in this particular pond. It was probably Sophia. They didn't know her name. They said there's a men Saeed who used to do mandi di koamini. That's what they said. So there are memory of them. They still have this memory of them having been there. But it wasn't specifically attached to Raffles. Okay. Then, okay, Raffles has another kind of good period, but then his children start dying. Leopold dies in June. In July, the commander of Raffles' ship dies after climbing the Sugar Old Fanta. Um, 1822, January, Stanford and Charlotte die. He's left with only one child out of four, and he sends her back to England right away. <coughs> and then another child is born at this country house, Rathang Balam, and she lived only about two months, and then she dies. So four out of five of Raffles' children all die in a very short time in the pool. And it's in this frame of mind that Raffles goes back to Singapore for the third and last time. Um, and so he um, went there, and he, he, um, then he sorry, returns to Bukulu in June, arriving back in uh, July. 
And in 1824, he's, he wants to retire. He's just had enough of life, basically. He has no more strength. He wants to go home. And of course, on the way out of Baku, the ship sinks with all his stuff on board. All his collections that he picked up in these four or five years in some of the Light Peninsula, Singapore, Sumatra, down to the bottom of the ocean. The ship burned. It didn't just sink, it burned. So unlikely there's anything left of it. So he had to wait for another few months to get a ship to go back again. And uh, so he gets back to London, 1826. In April, he becomes president of the Zoological Society. And then uh, three months later, he dies. This is Guru Mukul. And this is the trip I made up Guru Mukul. Unfortunately, I didn't die. And that's the view from the top of the sugar loaf. Very beautiful sight. And this is one of Raffles' letters, uh, which actually reports that the uh, last six months I've been so completely unnerved that I have scarcely written to any of my friends at home. We've hardly, um, hardly, sorry, yeah, hardly recovered, recovered the, the life of Sophie's ardent uh, eldest brother when from a carry, when, when someone carried off after a few days' illness. Um, on the branch, on the beginning, it talks about you know, then they lost our little boy Leopold and so on. So he, he just, uh, the last few years of Raffles' life were not at all happy ones. This is a contemporary kind of cartoon of Raffles' ship, the fame, going down. And they had to take lifeboats back to the land. Now, the end of the history of Java had an advertisement for another book, Antiquities of Java. Apparently, he planned to write something more on the archaeology. And uh, he was also going to do a second edition of the history. Um, so it's really unfortunate that Raffles died before he could complete a lot of his um, recording of his projects. But uh, as he said in one of his last, in one of his letters, my object, as you know, is rather to collect the raw materials than to establish any system of my own. He was not a theoretician. He always bemoaned the fact that he never really, he, he left school at 14. And so most of the rest of his education he had to get on his own informally. Um, and, but he can he can do himself more to be a collector of data and then and that's basically what he was trying to do. Record as much as he could to bring back artifacts again for study. Uh, this is a one of these paintings uh, probably showing Raffles house on top of Fort Fanning. It's supposed to be the Delangon's house. Um, it says Delangon's house and, uh, and it shows this very high hill, it's a bit higher than Fort Fanning really is, but um, you know, basically, Raffles did have a, a, an extremely trying existence, and I think maybe his uh, scientific and archaeological historical endeavors were maybe what kept him going as long as they did. So he did collect a lot of data. A lot of it has still not even been processed, like these drawings in the British Museum. So even 200 years later, Raffles' work, the collections he made, are still of some significance to us today, in part because no one will ever be able to recover all the things that he saw. Okay, I think that to give you a bit of an idea of how Raffles, we can study the archaeology of Raffles, both in terms of what he did for archaeology and what archaeological research we can do on Raffles himself. Thank you very much. <laughs>